Hello everybody, I'm um, starting my stream here a little bit early. I'll um, I'll wait till 4 o'clock till I do anything substantive. I just want to know, everybody know that I'm um, Mark Weitzman. My YouTube channel is um, Theoretical Physics with Mark Weitzman. This is sort of a um, semi-course that I'm running with... Um, on Piazza, Group Theory and Physics. Um, Piazza is a site where I host almost all of my um, material. Um, I have three sites on my Piazza and um, once you sign up you can um, post things, questions, and read other people's and re read my announcements. Then I have like a resources page where I have a lot of stuff, you know, uh, my videos that I've made on the topic as well as this one's on group theory, as well as a lot of notes that I've made on um, some textbooks. And then this is an actual textbook that's hard to get online, so I've put it here. Um, the Texas file is quite large. I got it off the... Uh, Internet Archive. I'm trying to get myself centered here. Um, and um, it's sort of typed and handwritten. It was self published. It's an amazing book, but I'll talk more about it when I get to the lecture. These are my own latex notes that I'm making in the book that are compressed by about 50%. I'll talk more about that. And this is the book that I'm talking about. Um, I got these this off the Internet Archive. This is my own copy. It's sort of like um, falling apart, as you can see. And um, it's gotten a lot of use over the years. Um, going back to my um, Piazza site, I have two other sites. My main site is um, called Topics in Theoretical Physics. And here on the resources page, I have like just all the links and everything that I've found useful over the years. Could be video links, it could be um, notes, um, anything I've had on just about all topics in theoretical physics. And, um, you know, the other side I have is. Um, another course that I'm developing that I'm very far behind on and it's um, quantum field theory of students perspective over the years on this course I've gotten a lot of um, questions and everything I think I have about 500 people enrolled in this course and 500 on the topics and theoretical physics site but the group theory site is new and uh, so what is it saying I have about 23 right now Anyway, um, so you can watch the videos and then get more detail, you know, a lot more detail on the uh, site. Um, I have a new microphone, by the way. I hope the audio is better than it's been in the uh, past. This is supposedly a very fancy mic USB microphone, and um, hopefully it's picking up the sound much better than... Um, it's a S-H-U-R-E, something like that. So um, that is um, what I'm looking to. I'll get started here in about three minutes. Um, there's, um, I used to do a lot of MOOCs online and everything, and um, I've been staff for some of them. Um, 8.05x is finished about a, a few weeks ago and um, it always takes a while to load I don't know why but um, you know I was the uh, moderator on the discussion forum for this course this is the second of the very good and advanced quantum mechanics courses at MIT Sometime this year, probably 8.06 applications of quantum mechanics will run. Um, the book 
out of the course came a textbook published by Barton Zeibach, and um, here it is. Um, so the idea uh, 8.06x will probably be coming up soon. I do not know when. And um, another MITx. This is all on the new site MITx online. Um, hopefully you're all familiar or getting familiar with this site. These used to be run on edX, and now they run on MITx online. Some courses are still being run on edX. Um, another course that's just finishing up right now is a um, course on vibration and waves. And one of the things with the group theory is that I hope to... Um, get to um, this course is finishing up I think the final exam is just ending and then um, there's another course starting in a couple of um, weeks it's taught by Jim Freewicks of Georgetown University his quantum mechanics course just ended but he's he has a um, I'm not going to be able to find it, but he has a mathematical methods at about mathematical methods course at about the sophomore level, and um, it should be starting um, in about two days, I think. So you might want to look. This is on edX, Georgetown University, Jim Freewicks. You might want to look at that if you need help with some um, mathematical physics. Now, um, okay, so it's 4 o'clock, so welcome everybody. Today, um, as I said, I want to um, continue um, group theory in physics, and I want to um, continue with um, Shanestead's book, which is an excellent book, and... Um, covers a lot of things that you don't find elsewhere on the symmetric group and Young's diagrams. And um, so let's begin. Let's begin by um, reviewing and picking up where we ended last time. So we had a um, group representation. And this is, um, you know, a lot of times you'll hear like group theory and physics and everything, but what physicists are really, theoretical physicists, are really interested in is uh, group representations. Because group representations act on linear vector spaces and... Um, Sorry, they act on linear vector spaces, and um, that's where like quantum mechanics takes place, and everything is in you know Hilbert space, a linear vector space. So um, okay, so I have some remarks about the sound is very good. Thank you very much, and um, so we're really interested for the most part in group representations, and in a while I'll explain why. But let's just review what it is. Let's say we have a group, call it G. And uh, uh, in these lectures, for now, until, until a little while, I'm always talking about finite groups. And if we have a, the group representation, this is a set of square matrices of the same dimension that uh, act on a uh, vector space usually but not always complex sometimes we deal with real vector spaces 
And um, so with looking at that, and the main thing is is that if if we have the following, if A and B are in G, and A B equals C, this is the group multiplication. This implies that gamma, and gamma is what we're going to call the matrix that represents the group element A. This implies that gamma of A, gamma of B, is equal to gamma of AB. That's what we mean by a group representation, or and this is also equal to gamma of C. And um, the, the gamma matrices <clears throat> need not be distinct um, and like for example the most trivial matrix is gamma gamma of A is the identity matrix on let's say n dimensions for all of the group elements this is clearly a group representation it's what we call the trivial representation. We just represent everything by the gamma matrix. And this over here is uh, trivially um, solved. So um, that's like one example. But if they are distinct, we say the representation, and I'll usually abbreviate rep by REP, is faithful. Usually we find in physics that um, um, often we find in physics that we have like two to one representations like spinners in the rotation group, the relationship between SU2 and SO3. Now, um, when we have a representation, the first thing we want to check is, is it reducible? And um, so a, a reducible representation is one where the form of gamma, gamma of AJ, is equal to what we call block diagonal. And this happens for every, uh, every matrix in the group. It's not just one group element. It's all of them have a particular form. I'll call it like gamma of A Let me go back to AJ here. I don't know why that didn't erase. AJ. And then here will be like big fat zeros. And then we'll have like a gamma B of AJ. This is what's called a reducible representation. Because basically what happens is, and this, these don't have to have the same dimensions, but it's block diagonal. This could be like 3 by 3, and this could be 2 by 2, and these will be rectangular. But it basically splits the um, basis elements for the uh, vector space. call it S, into, uh, into two, two um, I don't want to use the word grouping, into two um, sets, let's say, that don't interact. If you were to think of this like an operator in quantum mechanics, the matrix elements between one set and the other set would be zero. And, and you can keep on reducing. Oftentimes, these themselves will be reducible. And you'll get 
and you'll get something like You'll get something like zeros everywhere, except on the diagonal you'll have like gamma A, gamma B, gamma C. And this is for all, for all group elements. So this is what a reducible representation is, and when we have a reducible representation, we like to uh, get it in this form. An irreducible representation is one I had a comment last time about my handwriting and yes it is terrible but I'm 67 years old right now and it's not going to change but uh, I'm not the first physicist with terrible handwriting, but uh, still, that's the way it is. But anyway, so if you have a irreducible representation, it means it uh, can't be can't be block diagonalized. Now, in a sense, you can't always tell. You can't just look at a matrix like. Let's say look at several of the uh, things and say, okay, this isn't block diagonal because the basis elements aren't fixed. You can um, diagonalize any given matrix. I can, I can, if it's a Hermitian matrix, which this is not, but if uh, if we have like a Hermitian matrix. I can diagonalize it so that it might have the form 3, 4, 1, but only for maybe one group element. I have to do it, in order to um, diag block diagonalize, I have to do it for all the group elements. So. Anyway, the, um, the irreducible representations, these are the building blocks for all, rep, for all, rep, all finite, say for all the uh, representations. We know the uh, irreducible ones. The reducible ones are just irreducible ones stacked up. Okay. Now, um, so let me ask, ask, ask and answer a question that I alluded to earlier. I'm sorry. Why do we care? about all these representations. This is a question that confused me. I remember studying quantum field theory and I was like, well, okay, I understand the symmetries of the rotation group and everything, but why don't I just use the group elements with the rotation group? What does it matter? Um, why do I care about whether it's a, a spinner representation or a vector representation or a scalar representation? I was a little confused. And there's a very simple answer for that, and I'll, I'll just review why right now. Um, so some of you may have... Oops. Um, some here may have... Um, a good knowledge of uh, tensors. Okay, if not, just think of matrices.
let's say we have a 3 times 3 matrix or tensor and we're doing working with um, symmetries under the uh, three-dimensional rotation group. Okay, well, let's, um, so imagine we're taking the, uh, what we do in quantum mechanics, we take uh, what's called a direct product, but you can just think of it times. So three times three is nine. And we find out that it breaks up into like one plus three, this is a direct sum. Don't worry about the details of this plus 5. So what does this mean? Well, the 1 means that there's a component. We call it a scalar. Also, it's the trace of the matrix, which transforms by itself. It's just a one-component object. When you start studying quantum mechanics, for instance, you'll have the wave function, and it's just the one thing by itself. Later on, you'll do spin, and you'll get two component objects, and so on. The three is like a, um, you can represent it as an anti-symmetric matrix. And it's sort of like isomorphic to like a vector. And then the five... This is a symmetric traceless matrix, and it's often used to represent, like in electromagnetism, quadrupoles. Now the point is, is that these things don't mix. You can treat them separately. And What's more is they have different degrees of freedom. The scalar has one degree of freedom. The vector has three degrees of freedom. And the quadrupole has five degrees of freedom. Different degrees of freedom means you have different equations. Different equations. Differential equations, let's say. For various degrees of freedom. So that's why this is all important. And saying something has rotational symmetry or spherical symmetry doesn't mean it's a scalar. It could be a vector. It could be a quadrupole. It could be a second-rank tensor. So that's, why, that's where group theory is, is very important. Um, in quantum mechanics, you know, you come across this right away. You know, when you look at, for example, angular momentum, let's say either uh, orbital or spin, you have things like, um, a spin, spin zero like particle is a scalar or field is a scalar and it has one component. Spin one half has a, it's called a spinner. It has two components. And then you'll have like a, a spin one vector you'll have three components usually the the rule is um 2j plus 1 where j is the total angular momentum then you'll have like a you even have sometimes you'll study like um for spin 3 halves particles like 
right? Uh, Schwinger, they have a famous equation that says like four components, then spin two, tensor. The spherical is going to be five components. Okay, so that's the sort of why, in case you were wondering. Now, um, I also, I think, briefly mentioned last time, and I'm going to go into more detail here. My cat wants to be fed right now. The smallest non-abelian group is of order... Six. That's the number of elements it has, and it's known as um, call it either D three or S three. They're isomorphic. The D three is the uh, dihedral dihedral group, and um, in this particular case, that just corresponds to the symmetries of an equilateral triangle and um, with S3 it's just the uh, permutation permutation group on three elements So, if you think of an equilateral triangle in the plane, let's say it has vertices A, B, and C, and let's say this is the center of the triangle, and if you remember your uh, Euclidean geometry, the medians and the perpendicular bisectors or certainly for an equilateral triangle they all meet at one point we'll call it the center of the triangle and we have the symmetries that's my cat scratching over there um, I don't know if you can, can't quite see him Anyway, we have the symmetries. The first symmetry is the identity element, do nothing. So I either use E or E for the identity element. Then we have an element C, which is a uh, counterclockwise let's call this line over here um, L1, L3, and L2. Counterclockwise rotation of um, 2 pi over 3, 120 degrees. C bar is a uh, clockwise of um, 2 pi over 3. 120 degrees and then we have sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 and these are all uh, reflections about you know L1 L2 L3 so if we were to flip like sigma 1 the you can see how this group is isomorphic to the permutation group. If you imagine labeling the triangle as ABC, now we were to flip it about this axis, B would go to C and C would go to B. So this would go to A, C, B under sigma 1. And then under, let's say, under C bar, why it doesn't erase. Under um, C bar, clockwise rotation by 120 degrees, A would go to C, 
C would go to B, and B would go to A. So you can see that you could think of it as. It's amazing. Excuse me. I don't know. For those of you who have these um, devices that listen like Google, whatever, I, I didn't say anything near like, hey, what that. So I don't know why that started speaking. Um, so you can think of these as permutations or symmetries in the plane. And um, Shinestad, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name right, by the way. She was um she passed away a few years ago. I think she lived to the age of 95. She was married to a mathematician. She herself was a prominent theoretical physicist and she lived in New England and and she was at the University of Michigan and she um retired to Florida and she uh self-published some of these books along with her husband. So um and they did really good work on a lot of areas of of um discrete mathematics and um theoretical physics. Um, so she calls this group GB, and, um, there's a multiplication table. Usually when you have, like, a, mo a group, you can, a small, finite group, you draw yourself a multiplication table. And you put like elements, you know, you put the elements of the group, E, C, C bar, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, and on the top, same thing, E, C, C bar, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. And then you fill in, like I'll fill in one row here, um, C bar, E, C, Sigma 2, Sigma 3, Sigma 1, and then this is C bar, E, Sigma 3, Sigma 1, Sigma 2. What's important is what's called the rearrangement lemma. Uh, I don't want to call it a theorem, let's call it a lemma, but... For groups, what happens is, is every row of a group is just a reordering of the elements of the group. You can never have two elements of the group, to, uh, one in the same row or in the same column. You know, you have to have, they all have to, it's just a reordering. And this um, enforces the um, inverse property and the identity property of the group. Um, associativity, you have to check separately because this doesn't guarantee associativity. Now, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to try and... So this is Shenanza's book. And these are my notes, and you can see that here I have the whole group table filled in in case you have, it's easy to calculate, you know, and here's another picture. So, um, also, and this, this is right out of her book, you know, I just copied it in my notes. My notes are just complete, um, I don't want to say plagiarism because I'm not going to publish it or anything like that. Um, somebody's asked for recommendations for books. I'm going to tell him very simply. Uh, Feynman Lectures on Physics. Uh, 
There's nothing better. Um, they're available online. Just type Feynman into your Google thing. Here they are. Volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3. This site from Caltech also has its tips on physics. His excellent Cornell lectures that are well worth watching. You can have the lecture recordings, the photos, the notes, original course handouts. And if you go to the original lecture, you can get problems and solutions. And if you go to volume one, let's say, and you look at, um, let's say, uh, I don't want to scare you. I'm going to give you a, an easy topic, um, theory of gravitation. There's an outline of the lecture, and then there's Feynman's lecture notes. And it's all beautifully typeset and everything, all corrected. There were significant number of small mistakes in the original course but and you can get just from a, the top notch one of the top theoretical physicists in the, the 20th century and this is a great way to learn physics um, otherwise any of the standard um, textbooks that uh, you know there's so many of them I, I learned from Halliday and Resnick advanced placement physics um, but I recommend the earlier editions. They've been dumbed down a little bit. Physics, PA, Parts 1 and 2. That's what I studied for AP Physics. And uh, But I highly recommend the Feynman Lectures on Physics. On my sites on Piazza, I have um, all kinds of things where I... Um, give recommended books and I have like a whole um, playlist of about 20 lectures on books for theoretical physicists I think in um, so it's it's on one of my sites anyway I want to get back to my lecture here so in her book these are um, six representations of the groups these are the group elements and these are the matrices that correspond to the groups. I call them, she calls them, gamma. And like I said, I've copied from her notes. You know, I'm not plagiarizing because I'm not trying to pass it off as my own work. But I've cut down her book, which was, you know, half handwritten and half typed. I cut it down by about 50%, you know, just for myself so I can get the essence of it and, not, and, and it makes it easier for me to review. But the first representation here is the trivial representation. As I said, you assign the number one to every group element. The second representation is also a one-dimensional representation, and it's what they call the uh, permutation. Um, I'm sorry, the, um, oh, the word's escaping me all of a sudden. Um, anyway, it, this is a representation which assigns one to every even permutation and minus one to every odd permutation. So that's another um, representation. Every permutation group has this, assuming it's a dimension higher than one. Now, gamma circle three is also is a two-dimensional representation, and I actually have these matrices. And you can check. You can multiply this matrix by this matrix, and you should get whatever EC bar is. You, know, you can go back to this table and say, what's EC bar? It's C bar. Obviously, the identities thing and so on. So this is another representation. And um, there are, and then I have three more representations, which I'll discuss shortly. There are an infinite number of reducible representations. You can always keep stacking irreducible representations in various blocks, but some have more importance than others. So in this table... I'm going to go back to my iPad now. In this table, gamma 1 circled, 2 circled, 3 circled are irreducible. And it's not obvious. The one-dimensional representations are obviously irreducible, but it's not obvious that the two-dimensional representation is irreducible. These are the irreducible representations. 
of GB. And they're the only irreducible representations of the, uh, the group GB, which is equal to um, isomorphic to um, D3 or S3. So, and you might notice, this is hard to see, but it's a very important theorem that we'll discuss next time. This is of dimension 1. This is of dimension 1. And this is of dimension 2. And notice that 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared is equal to 6. And this is going to always happen. This is the sum of the irreducible representations in the groups of di squared is equal to n. And n is the uh, order of the group. number of elements in the group. So the first three representations that were on that page are, um, are the uh, irreducible representations. Gamma 4 is a three-dimensional representation And if you look carefully, I'm going to go back to that page. If you look carefully at gamma 4, you'll see that it seems to be gamma 1 stacked up with gamma two, 3. You notice this block over here is over here. There's always the 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So... This is equal to gamma 1 plus gamma 2. That's the reduction. That tells you it's reducible. Um, gamma 5 is also a three-dimensional representation. And what I said before is that it's reducible. This is known as the... Um, defining representation for um, S3. And what it is is, um, let's say you take a typical matrix like 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. If you define, like before I had like A, B, C, let's say I represent them I represent A by a column vector, 1, 0, 0. B is uh, 0, 1, 0. And C is equal to 0, 0, 1. And this permutation itself corresponds to um, C over here. So this is C is equal to. And you'll notice that C, A just using matrix multiplication is equal to, let's see, it's 0, 0, 1, so I got 0 there, I get 1 here, and I get 0, 1, 0 times 0, 0, and this is equal to B. So um, this defines, you know, clockwise, when we did um, before, I, I did the anti-clockwise, but if I did the clockwise, I would have, um, I mean, if I did the counterclockwise, A, B, C, under C, A would go to B, C would go to um, A, and, I'm sorry, this is a counterclockwise, A goes to B, C goes to A, and B goes to C. And you can check, so A goes to B is the important thing there. And we have here C, A equal B. So these six, these matrices over here in gamma 5, they just implement the permutation group directly. But it's not irreducible. It is reducible, and that's interesting. Gamma 6... It's a six-dimensional representation. 
and it's what we call the regular representation. And this is um, very, 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 um, okay, I'm sorry, I made, I didn't switch back to the iPad. Okay, so I, I established that CA is equal to B if we represent elements by uh, columns. Um, so gamma 6 is a six-dimensional regular representation. This will play a very important role in um, the theory. I don't want to go into the definition of what the regular representation is, but the regular representation always has the dimensions of the number of elements in the group and it always um when you reduce it we'll prove this later but when the uh regular rep is reduced like in this particular case we'll find that gamma 6 is equal to gamma 1 plus gamma 2 plus gamma 3 plus gamma 3, which we'll often write this as gamma 1 plus gamma 2 plus 2 gamma 3. And every matrix you know, will be in block diagonal form You'll have like um, a number here. I'll just put the number one. I'll just put gamma one here. Gamma one is one dimensional. And then there'll be gamma two, which is also one dimensional. This is for a, a, an arbitrary group element. And then we're gonna have gamma three which is going to be like a box, two by two box, and then we'll have a repeat of the gamma three. And what we'll find is that whenever we, we reduce the regular representation, we end up, um, we end up, ha it contains every irreducible representation and not only that, it contains it a number of times equal to its dimension. So gamma circle 3 has a, has a dimension of 2. It's irreducible, and it will occur twice in the um, regular representation. Okay. Um, so I think that's as far as I want to go today. Um, in the next lecture... In the next live stream, what I want to do is I want to cover the major theorems, major theorems of, uh, let's call it, finite group representations. And then, um, and this will like include the very important orthogonality theorem. See, what group theory does is, some of you may have had Fourier analysis. And with Fourier analysis, you know you go back and forth and everything, but Fourier analysis is basically one-dimensional. Group theory deals with symmetries that are like higher dimensional because they deal with non-abelian groups, not just numbers. They deal with operators and objects that don't commute. So we need the analog of what Fourier analysis is for multidimensional objects. And that's what these, um, these major theorems will give us and the orthogonality theorem. And we'll talk about characters sorry, characters and character analysis,
So, you know, this type of thing is an example of character analysis. Using the characters of the representations, I can get this decomposition. I don't actually have to block diagonalize every element of the group and see that it works. I can just use characters to get this. And then, um, so this that will finish lecture three of Shinestead. Like, finish... Lecture three of uh, by the way, Shinestead's book. I should have said this earlier, but um, Shinestead's book is two courses. One is a very sh a short course. See here, it's a short course on the app part one, and it's about. 60, 70 pages. The rest of the book, part two, has much more detail and goes much farther and is about 300 more pages. So she originally published the, um, the short course in 1966 and then 10 years later when the quark model, and this all is like relates to the quark model and everything, it helps understand that. When we had the quark model, uh, she republished and, and vastly extended everything to um, the 360-page book that it is now. Now, um, so, and then I want to go to lecture four, which has uh, applications. Applications to quantum mechanics. Things like selection rules. Perturbation theory. Especially uh, degenerate perturbation theory. And then, um, then we'll just briefly mention continuous groups. Now, I just want to outline sort of like where we're going. Um, most books on group theory in physics, like Z's group, and um, let me just read this remark. Yeah, all these books, there's a lot of good books on mechanics. Taylor has one. Kleppner is a little bit more difficult than the average one, but it's good. All of these are good for um, for learning physics and getting, you know, A pluses in your college courses if you're there. The Feynman lectures will teach you to think like a theoretical physics physicist, so I highly recommend also reading those. Um but what I wanted to add was um, all of the books like by Anthony Z and Tong and everything, they always start out with uh, finite groups, and there's a lot of important theorems in that. But you might say we don't really use other than maybe people who do like lattices and condensed matter physics and chemistry and everything, they need all those symmetries of lattices and everything. But for particle physicists, and that's where my emphasis is, and quantum field theory and everything, we're always dealing with continuous groups and continuous symmetries. Groups like um, U1, unitary group in one dimension, that's for electromagnetism, SU2, spin or weak interactions, SU3, color, um, gauge theories. And then there's like Grand Unified, what we call Guts, you know, SU5, SO10. Then if you go to String Theory, you'll do exceptional groups like E8, you know, etc. But what's interesting about these continuous groups is that they're related to the finite groups. For instance, to understand everything about the quark model and everything, you need to understand all the representations 
and you need to understand things like direct products like if you have a a quark might be reset let's just do like su3 flavor the flavor groups not the color but things like the um, top and bottom quarks I'm, I'm sorry that's a different generation I want the up and down quarks this is what the proton you know a proton is made up of um, up up down quark and a neutron is an up down down quark these are the valence quarks there's a lot more stuff there gluons and antiparticles particle pairs and so on so um i know tongue recent not tongue um oh i can't his name slips me but um one prominent physicist who has a lot of notes on uh, quantum field theory, he recently gave a lecture where he said, quarks are more complicated than the valence quarks. Yes, we know that. Um, but the thing is, is that, um, so these are what we call the main, the defining representation of SU3, what we call the three. And the antiparticles would be in the three bar antiparticles. But sometimes you like combine them. You do things like a three cross a three bar. And you get something like a one plus an eight. So these are like mesons. You know, you may have heard of these things. And scalars. So we need to know how to um, do things like Clash Gordon decompositions and products and everything. And to do all of this stuff, it turns out to analyze the general uh, linear general linear group in n dimensions, or the um, unitary group in n dimensions, or the special unitary, and I'll define these in future lectures, in n dimensions. It turns out that to analyze all these things, the analysis needs the symmetric group. Or the permutation group. So that's the connection between the finite and the continuous groups. And that's why what we're doing right now is um, fairly important. And um, so that's all I have to say today. I'll come back next time and we'll, um, we'll continue. I highly recommend, and I'm going to put an end note on this video, but, you know, go to my site, this one or the other ones, Post um, questions if you have any. And um, like I said, all the material is here. Um, ja an individual asked earlier who was 17 years old about how to learn physics. And one thing I, I would tell everybody is, while sometimes watching physics videos is entertaining and everything, the only really way t to learn this stuff is to um, get yourself a good textbook and... and verify all the equations and do all the problems you know if you have a teacher in a lecture helping you out that's okay and everything but all these MOOCs and everything you really can't learn without the books you, sometimes for very new stuff where the book isn't there you'll need notes but I highly recommend um, digging into the um, textbooks so um, that is um, that is all I have to say today. I'm going to stop streaming now. I hope everything worked technically. Sometimes I make mistakes. Gradually I'm improving. I think the sound will be much better this time. And um, I'm getting used to this um, OBS and YouTube software. So till uh, next week, thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.